Let us move on with a new topic uh, okay, which is not a completely new topic, it is essentially whatever we have learnt in kinematics now we are carrying over and topic is kinetics okay. again the main text, main resources everything remains the same. So, what I am going to discuss is I am going to discuss Newton's second law of motion, linear momentum of a particle just a side topic on system of units okay, we do not need to bother with this, equations of motion and what is this concept of dynamic equilibrium or how do we relate the forces acting on a body with the corresponding accelerations towards the end okay we will also discuss what is the angular momentum of a particle conservation of angular momentum and how to write kinetics equation in radial and transverse components or in normal and tangential components okay we will do that now there was a there have been many questions okay that what is the difference between kinetics and kinematics so kinematics is something for example which means that you are just looking at a trajectory of a particle or a rigid body you see how it moves but as we all know for example uh, that if you take a, a, a discus okay an iron discus which is thrown by a discus thrower and you take a flying disc uh, a flying saucer made of plastic both can have very similar trajectories. But we clearly know that to give the same trajectory to a, a normal flying disc that we use for playing and the same trajectory for example thrown in for uh, by this Olympic throwers okay it is not you need to apply different forces in order to maintain the same trajectory. So, the topic is that that given that you have a particular trajectory that you want to maintain for a for a particle or for a rigid body then what should be the forces okay that should be applied to that body to keep it in motion is for example if you want to design a wheelchair okay for uh, if uh, for this uh, for a motion round down the ramp then what we need to find out is what are the forces acting on the various components of that. So, kinematics can only help us so much it can tell us that what is the acceleration of every point what is the acceleration of this person and so on okay. But from those accelerations we want to find out what are the reactions that are exerted at the joints okay and so on then we need to really go into Newton's laws of motions and use okay them to find out what are the internal forces based on the kinematics that we have done so far okay. So, that is the purpose behind the kinematics of particles. Uh, kinetics of particles kinematics only give you a visual picture but from that visual picture what are the underlying forces that come only from kinetics or application of Newton's laws through the to the acceleration that we see from kinematics. Newton's second law strictly speaking works on a particle now particle is an abstract concept but what we had seen so far is that particle does not mean strictly a point it only means that the overall dimensions are small when compared to the overall length scale of the problem okay that for example, if it is a small ball okay. So, the overall if the ball is very small compared to the overall distance it travels and so on maybe we can neglect it and the rotation of the objects is neglected okay the demonstration I had shown with Mathematica okay when you neglect the rotations of the objects then that is when it becomes extremely uh, it becomes extremely and rigorously clear that when the rotations are not there okay or we are neglecting then essentially a whole three dimensional body is a uh, is a particle. Now, what is the Newton's law of motion? Newton's law of motion say that for a particle if f is the are the bunch of forces acting on the particle then sum of all the forces is nothing but the mass of the particles times the acceleration of the particle. Now, that is where for example, why we were completely obsessed with getting the acceleration of various particles that when we apply all manner of forces to the particle then the forces result in acceleration. You can even pose a reverse problem that if the acceleration of a particle is given okay that the particle is moving for example, if you create a channel that a particle should move through a channel or you create a road surface and you say that a car has to go along that track then the question we ask ourselves is that that what should be the forces that should be generated in order to keep that particle on the track. So, you can pose the question in any way in one way is that given the forces and the mass of the particle what is the acceleration the reverse way is that given that the particle is following this trajectory what are the forces acting on it and we will see when we solve a variety of problems that there are a number of problems in real life where both of the situations can come into picture okay that where we know the trajectory we need to find out what are the forces that would be applied on the other hand we need we know what are the forces and we need to find out that what are the corresponding acceleration that the particle undergoes okay. Now, this one thing okay which I did not emphasize so much okay during kinematics because it does not really 
uh, you don't really have to worry about that thing when we do kinematics. But this law, strictly speaking, works. Okay, not strictly speaking, it only works in a Newtonian or, a, or an inertial frame of reference. That if we are moving, if we are in a stationary frame, or we are moving in a frame which moves with a constant velocity, only then can you apply this laws of motion f is equal to m. If, for example, a frame is accelerating, what do you mean by accelerating frame? That if it is moving in a straight line, its velocity is constantly changing, or if it is moved in a curve, moving in a curved direction, then the direction is constantly changing. Or, for example, in many mechanical components, what do we have? We have many gears, okay, which are many gears connected to each other, many components which rotate about, uh, which rotate with respect to each other, okay. And then, if we fix a coordinate frame or if we fix a frame of reference with relative to these rotating members, then those are not inertial frames of references. Similarly, strictly speaking, our earth is not an inertial frame of reference. Why? Because our earth rotates around its own axis. So, clearly it is not an inertial frame of reference. And it, we see that, for example, the fact that the earth is not an inertial frame of reference is reflected in what is called as a Coriolis force, which can be observed on a pendulum, for example, that is oscillated. And it also manifests itself in various different ways. For example, in the uh, in the cloud, <coughs> in the atmospheric patterns, in the patterns of clouds, for example, in a moving frame, okay, that the, the acceleration of the earth, the rotation of the earth about its own axis, it reflects itself in, for example, effects that, for example, how do clouds move, how does atmosphere, uh, how does uh, the pressure differences happen and so on, okay. So, that is beyond the topic of this course, okay. But all these different concepts are affected due to the rotation of the earth which strictly speaking is not an inertial frame of reference. But for all day to day problems, okay, rather than this climate, uh, climatology problems, okay, the simple problems about uh, what are the forces acting on a car and so on, we can do some very simple calculations and figure out that the Coriolis forces or the centripetal forces that are acting okay, are very small and for all practical purposes, we can neglect them. Okay? So, as far as this course is concerned, we are not going to bother about the so called non inertial frames of references, we are going to worry only about the inertial frame of references and this Newton's law okay, will be used only in inertial frames of references where the frame of reference has no acceleration, okay, it moves at a speed, uh, at a velocity which is constant. Now, there is another uh, question which uh, a lot of us uh, keep asking that if you take a rigid body, okay, a full rigid body, why is it fair to say, okay, why is it fair to say that for that rigid body, the mass is concentrated at the center of mass? Okay, that there is a center of mass, the mass is concentrated at the center of mass and force is nothing but mass times acceleration of the center of mass. What makes that center of mass so special? So, what I will do is that I would definitely deal with this when we go to uh, rotations of rigid bodies, but, but before that let me briefly explain that where does this concept come about. Now, a rigid body okay, can be thought of to be a collection of a bunch of particles. Okay one rigid body you take, each rigid body had lot of small elements and these small elements can be thought of as a group of particles. Okay, now, these particles I have drawn to be spheres just for simplicity. I can take them as cubes or whatever direction, whatever thing they want, uh, whatever dimensions or whatever shapes they want to have. But let us say that these are a collection of particles which I am representing my rigid body as. Now, these particles in a rigid body, what we have seen that a body is rigid when, for example, any two points, you join them and whatever motion these undergo, these two points, for example, the distance between them does not change. This is AB, this is A prime, B prime and a body is rigid means that the distance AB should be equal to distance A prime, B prime or in other words, the distance between any of these particles should not change. Now, how does that happen? That happens because all the particles apply equal and opposite forces on each other. Okay? This particle apply equal and opposite force on each other. Why? By Newton's third law. They can apply a pushing force or a pulling force. Okay? So, I do not need to draw all of them, but you can imagine that all these particles can exert various amount of forces on each other. Those forces okay, exerted by ith particle on jth particle, let me call as f bar i j. Okay. Now, on this set of particles, you also have some external forces acting. 
let me call them as F1, F2, these are the external forces. These are the internal forces which happen in between. Additionally, this can also have forces like this F1, F2, which in this discrete picture I can show to happen like this and so on. Fk. Now, you can apply Newton's law to each and every particle. Okay? Clearly, you can apply Newton's law on each and every particle. What does that say? For any ith particle, okay, sum of all the forces is equal to mass of the ith particle times the acceleration of the ith particle. Now, we write down this equation for all particles. and then sum over all the forces. Okay? What will we see? That sum of all internal forces, vectorial sum, both internal, because all the forces will be taken care of, internal forces and external forces, because we are adding the influences of all the forces on all the particles, plus forces external. But what will this be equal to? This will be equal to nothing but sum of masses and the accelerations of each and every particle. But note one thing that the internal forces they come in pairs. If this is positive, it has to be negative, equal and opposite. So, what will happen is that when we sum over all the particles, these internal forces they cancel off and their sum becomes 0. So, what we are left with is only the external forces, and so what do we have? that F bar external sum over all the external forces is nothing but sigma m i times acceleration of i particle. But this can also be written as 1 by sigma m i okay, into sigma m i into sigma m i. Okay, a i. But what is this quantity? This quantity is nothing but the acceleration of the center of mass and this quantity is nothing but the total mass of all these particles which is nothing but the total mass of this rigid body. And as a result what do we see? That for a rigid body sum of all the external forces should be nothing but equal to the mass of the rigid body times the acceleration of its center of mass. So, this is the simple idea that why even though Newton's law is strictly speaking applicable only for a particle, we can view a rigid body that we see in any real world, okay, a car or a truck or a plane or a wheelchair or a, or a chair or, or anything that you can think of. You can think that as a combination of particles and then for those sum of all the forces is nothing but a total mass times the acceleration of the center of mass. So, that is the simple understanding that even though Newton's law is strictly speaking defined only for a particle. The sum uh, you can also define that equivalently for a bunch of particles which is nothing but a representation for a rigid body and the particles cannot change their distances with respect to each other because why we are representing a rigid body. Even in that case we can say that sum of all the forces is nothing but total mass times the acceleration of the center of mass. Now coming back to this. Now, this form is true for a constant mass system. There are some systems like jet planes, for example, where the mass is being lost. So, those we are not going to worry about them right now. If you have any worries or concerns about that, we can discuss them okay, offline, but not in these lectures. Now, we have to we first define this quantity, which is called as the linear momentum of a particle. Now, what is the linear momentum of a particle? The linear momentum of a particle, okay, we define it in a, in a reverse way. That we saw from Newton's laws that sum of all the forces Okay, acting on the particle or for a completely rigid body, okay, sum of all the external forces acting on the rigid body is nothing but mass times acceleration of the particle or in case of rigid bodies, it is acceleration of its center of mass. So, sum of all the forces is equal to m times dv by dt. If the mass is constant, okay, for example, we do not have a variable mass system, means for example, a truck is going, we see for example, a tanker uh, on many of our roads, it keeps on like leaking water, okay, it makes the road all wet. So, those are not the constant mass systems. We are looking about systems where, for example, the mass does not change. So, I can bring that mass inside. So, what do we have? That d by dt mv is the force, and this particular quantity mv, 
we call that as a linear momentum of a particle or a linear momentum of a body. So this L bar is one of the typical notations that is used for the momentum, which is nothing but mass of the particle or the mass of the body times the velocity of the particle or the velocity of the center of mass, whatever way. But for the time being, let us say that it is a particle, even if it is not a particle, it is a rigid body, we can think of that as a center of mass particle. So the linear momentum of a particle is nothing but mass times its velocity. Now there is a principle called as linear momentum conservation principle. It is a very straightforward principle, okay, it just comes from this. What it says is that if the sum of all the forces on the particle is 0, the linear momentum of the particle remains constant in both magnitude and direction. Duh. So what it is that a linear momentum remains constant, what does that mean? Sum of all the forces is 0. So dl by dt is equal to 0. What does that mean? That l should be independent of time or l is constant. Now l is constant means what? That the velocity, the, the momentum of the particle, the direction and magnitude both remains constant. Now the principle of linear momentum can also be used in the, in, in the form of components. Okay, we are going to do that. We have seen that F bar the resultant force, okay, F resultant is equal to dL bar by dt. Now we can break this L into components Lx and Ly. Fix a coordinate frame like this, I, J with an origin, okay, X and Y. So we can say it is Lx I plus Ly J. So F res is nothing but dL by dt and we can rewrite this as F resultant can also be written as Fx resultant I plus Fy resultant J. Okay, this is the magnitude in the x direction, magnitude in the y direction. And then what do we see is that we see that Fx r will be equal to dLx by dt and f y r is equal to d l y by d t and even if the resultant force is not 0, if the force in the x direction is 0, it means that the momentum in x direction is conserved. Okay. And if f y r is 0, then correspondingly momentum in y direction is conserved and if both forces are 0 then complete momentum is conserved. So the principle of conservation of momentum can also be written in two form in, in the form of components that you do not need to have wholesale momentum being conserved if the forces are in one particular direction are 0 then the corresponding component of momentum is conserved. Okay? More examples we will see when we come tomorrow. Now these are simple system of units we have been using. So 1 Newton is 1 kg 1 meter per second square in US or the imperial units, okay, one pound, okay, one pound uh, uh, force, uh, the unit of mass is, uh, is given as this, uh, we do not need to really bother about this, okay, we will try to use this as much as possible, let us forget about this. Now Newton's law equations of motion, okay, what is that? It says that the force is equal to m times acceleration and as we saw just a few moments ago that we can say break down the forces into components, we can also break down uh, acceleration into components x, y and z. So essentially what does we have? That sum of forces in the x direction is equal to m into ax, some same for some of the forces in y direction and in the z direction and ax can be written as x double dot, ay as y double dot and az as z double dot, okay, straightforward. Now there is an alternate expression of Newton's law, okay. We can say that, uh, we can say that the sum of all the forces minus ma, ma bar okay, is equal to 0 which is like the equilibrium problems that we had done. We say that this minus a bar is the inertial vector. So typically this kind of approach is used when you are in inertial, non-inertial frames of references but it is a very cumbersome approach okay, and as far as possible, okay, if, it is, if it is possible you should try to stick to the inertial frame of reference and not use this. There is a principle called as the Lambert's principle okay, which becomes convenient for some vibration problems okay, which will be discussed on 5th December. But as far as the rest of our portion for dynamics go, we are not going to use this dynamic equilibrium concept. We are simply going to use this concept that sum of all the external forces is equal to mass times the acceleration. Okay? Forget about this dynamic equilibrium. But this can be used sometimes to our advantages. The another name for that is D'Alembert's principle that we just think of this as a force in the opposite direction of acceleration and behave 
as if this entire system is in equilibrium and sum of all the forces including this inertial force is equal to 0. Okay. But this is not really required, we can go to the proper inertial frame of reference and can write that f bar is equal to m times a bar. Now comes the most important part, okay. what are the free body diagrams and kinetic diagrams. So free body diagrams we have already seen. Now this kinetic diagrams is one conceptual, uh, uh, it is a conceptual construction which you may or may not use, but it has been used extensively in this Beer and Johnston 10th edition and personally I feel that this kinetic diagrams really kind of clarify your understanding a lot. What these kinetic diagrams are, are, we will see in step by step. So first is that the free body diagrams is what we have done in statics. The kinematic diagram is a conceptual construction which, which is done okay, in order to get a proper understanding. It is not mandatory, but it definitely, definitely makes our conception okay, our, of our understanding or our representation much more transparent. Now what that is, let us go about it. What we have here is that that on this inclined plane, okay, we have a mass of 15 kg, load acting on it is through a frictionless pulley 225 Newton. Okay. The mass is given to us, we want to find out what is the dynamics of this particle given all these forces are, okay. what is the acceleration, what is the velocity and so on. So first look at the free body diagram. So what is the particle that we are, what is the mass that we are interested in is this 15 kg. So this is the body B which is of 15 kg that we are interested in. So we will try and isolate this, okay. we will isolate this. Now what are the various forces that are acting on this? Okay. First we draw our axis system, okay. we can draw a Cartesian, Cartesian means x, y, polar means E r, E theta, path means uh, E t, E n. Depending on what the problem is, we will see that there are various problems, so depending on what is the geometry of the problem and what is asked in the problem, we will decide whether to choose Cartesian, polar or path coordinates. Now what? For the timing, let us say we have chosen this Cartesian frame of reference y and x in these directions. Now what? Add in the applied forces. What is the forces? 225 Newton pulling force. We apply that which is the 225 Newton pulling force which will act on this. Second is the weight which act downwards. Okay. The supports with, this is the support which the mass has from the bottom wedge. Okay. If there can be a possibility of friction on it, we draw a direction for the friction. Okay. Now the drawing the direction of the friction, let us hold on to it for some time, we will solve a few problems where what direction to choose will become more clear. But for the time being, let us say that we know that under the application of this force, the mass is trying to move up and as a result, the friction acting on it is the kinetic friction and acting in the downward direction. But for a free body diagram, this is a normal reaction, this is the friction. Now what we have done is that we have done with the free body diagram, that there are no other forces that can act on this mass. Now we want to understand that under the application of all these forces, what happens to this body? In equilibrium, we were done. Once we figured out that what are the forces acting on it, for the body to be in equilibrium, we then find out what is this unknown reaction, what is the unknown force and we are done. But in this case, what we want to know is that, that the body is not in equilibrium, the body is moving, that the support reaction, the support friction force is not enough to maintain this body in equilibrium. So we want to know that under the application of all these forces, what will be the acceleration that the body get. Okay. And then this particular thing is that this is the free body diagram and this particular thing which we are going to draw is what we call as a kinetic diagram. What do we do? We isolate the body of interest which is the free body, draw the mass times acceleration for the particle. Okay. These are the two possible acceleration because this is our x frame, this is our y frame. So these are the two particular motions or the accelerations that this particle can have. It can have an acceleration in the y direction. We call that as m a y is the corresponding inertial term that we come here. So m times a y is the force that we have here, okay, uh, is mass times the acceleration. Upwards, the other uh, component of acceleration can be up the plane. So m a x okay, is the corresponding mass times acceleration for this particle. And what does Newton's law tell us? Newton's law tell us that this sum of forces should be equal to the sum of mass times acceleration. Now you may directly write that sum of the, all the forces mass times acceleration, but if you write this, then it becomes very clear that m times acceleration in this direction is sum of all forces in this direction and m times acceleration in this direction is the sum of all the forces in this direction. So if you draw the free body diagram as well as the kinetic diagram, then there is the chance of error becomes very low. Okay. And so that is why in this case in uh, equilibrium, this A becomes 0, the sum of all forces equal to 0, but in dynamics, okay, this need not be 0, 
we have to find out what the particular accelerations will be and these are two equipotent system that these forces will be equivalent to these kind of mass into acceleration. So, we say that force in this direction is mass time acceleration in this direction sum of all the forces in the normal directions is mass times acceleration in the y direction. We will draw another free body diagram and kinetic diagram. So, draw free body diagrams and kinetic diagrams for this block. Now, what do we want? We want to we want have we have now two bodies body B body A. We want to draw the free body diagrams for both block A and free body diagram and K D or the kinetic diagram for block, block B ok. So, first let us do look, look at this block A. We isolate this what are the forces acting on it? This is one tension, this is another tension acting here, third tension, fourth tension ok. Our x and y axis are chosen just for convenience. What are the applied forces ok? Mass ok, uh, uh, the gravity is the applied force, replace the supports ok, all the support reactions or the strings will apply internal uh, forces what are they? This is the tension, this is another tension, this tension coming down tension then this is the another part of the tension from this mass you can have a friction force acting downwards the direction will become more clear when we solve more problems normal reaction acting from here normal reaction acting from here friction force acting from here and now what will that do ok dimensions are shown the kinetic diagram this ok m of a y m of a x ok we want to figure out that what is happening to this at equilibrium this is equal to 0 when not in equilibrium ok. If this mass for example, remains in contact with this then the center of mass of this does not move in the y direction or the acceleration in the y direction is 0. Only acceleration that remains non-zero is the acceleration in this direction. So, these are the kinetic constraints that the fact that this cannot go down or lose contact immediately tell us that m a y is equal to 0 and this is m a x. This is the y axis we have chosen m a y in this direction x axis m a x in this direction. And what does Newton's law tell us that sum of all these forces in the x direction this inclined direction is equal to m times a x and sum of all the forces in the y direction is m times a y and because of the particular geometry of the problem this a y is 0 and we get equations and we can solve ok. So, with this much have a nice day I will see you tomorrow morning.